It still remains the biggest weekend crowd in the country's history. The queues of cars stretch back three miles on either side. Local petrol stations ran out. After four years of construction, the coat hanger designed Auckland Bridge's opening day was finally here. Saturday the 30th of May 1959, a month ahead of schedule one might add. The first day was reserved for vehicles to cross, and cross they did. The accompanying parade was named the Cavalcade of Progress. Aucklanders lined the streets as it worked its way from the city centre. Horses even got a look in. The mayor arrives. Toll booths ready themselves for the onslaught, the rather pricey equivalent of six dollars today. Little wonder there were protests as to the hefty fee. One uh, thirty five thousand would pay on the first day. Numbers which overwhelmed those manning the booths. They ran out of bags to store the money and began stuffing it into desks and into paper bags. By mid August, a million cars would cross. By the end of the year, well over the equivalent of more than one in two Kiwis. Meanwhile, late that morning, the same day, on the other side of town, Auckland Aero Club member Eric Barford had hired this Piper Cub. He certainly wasn't on the invite party list for the opening, unbeknownst to its owners. Shortly, their aircraft would be skimming at full tit, just 50 feet above the surface of Auckland Harbour, the allowed ceiling being 500. The pilot knew this was a risky exercise, not just from an aeronautical perspective. Once the aircraft was ID'd, the pilot logs checked, he would be gone, Burger. His wings would be clipped. Still, Eric had been through a lot worse situations in his lifetime. He'd been involved in the Battle of the River Plate off Uruguay at the end of 1939. On board the HMNZS Achilles. looking down the 11-inch barrels of the Admiral Graf's Bay. Meanwhile, on the bridge, things weren't exactly going to plan. Not only had the boosts been swamped, a couple of vintage cars had broken down. That lack of petrol also meant some cars had simply conked out halfway across. A terrified dog was on the loose and in danger of being run over. Little wonder people's attention wasn't skyward. The building process had already cost three lives. It was now a distinct possibility one or two more could be added. Two plucky 12 year olds had decided to skip a day, Sunday being when solely pedestrians were allowed to cross. By slipping underneath and trapezing along the water pipeline beneath the structure, Thankfully, before being discovered and plucked to safety. Most eyes were seaward, where a tug was doing a display. A flotilla of vessels surrounded the structure. The Navy vessel Starwell was about to become the first vessel to pass underneath. Little consideration was being given to the plane buzzing overhead. Clearly it was a gawker on a joyride, getting a bird's eye view of the day's proceedings. 
and their summation quickly changed as it descended, then skimmed above the water and was coming straight towards 142 foot centre spans, all whilst that precession was occurring. For a brief second or two, the shadow of the bridge and spans obscured the plane, then bang, it was through the other side. Their eyes on the bridge and lining the foreshore crowd or thought this daredevil act was all part of the day's events. Asked what he was thinking afterwards, the pilot Barford said, This will rock them. Well, Fisheldom, on the other hand, knew this was a rogue act and they had been completely caught off guard with their pants down. Shortly their inks would be further exacerbated when they spotted the plane had now turned and was making a second run and there was diddly squat they could do except scribble down the plane's details, cross fingers. By now more people had eyeballs on the aircraft. On board the Piper Cub, Eric Barford was enjoying himself, waving to the crowd. One pass or ten, he knew he was going to be in deep shit, and time therefore to make a second pass. And to put this mildly, his timing wasn't the best come pass number two. The official's safety concerns looked just about to be borne out. When Barford found himself a travelling at 90 miles per hour, looking straight at a launch coming towards him from the opposite side, exactly at the same time he was going under, he was looking down the gun again. The gap had been reduced considerably, to the point of some of the worried passengers on the sightseeing voyage dive for cover. Masterful piloting from the 46-year-old prevented the bridge's death toll increasing significantly. For good measure, he made a last and less eventful third pass. For the spectators, the highlight of the day was over. The more intent of those spectators were journalists. They were soon on the track of the thrill-seeking gatecrasher. When they tracked him down, the first question the newspaper men wanted to know was the most obvious. Why? Why? The reason he gave was somewhat like the mountaineer retort, because it's there. Needless to say, his membership of the Era Cub was suspended, and the Civil Aviation prosecuted him, for which he got a £50 fine. Remember the Piper Cub I had on that first screen back then? I tricked you by ageing it. The very same aircraft is privately owned and resides at Masterton's Hood Airport, Today, Eric would die at the ripe old age of 88 in 2001, and to close this out, now sit back and watch some photos of Sunday's crowds. If you thought Saturday was mayhem, Sunday was worst. 106,000 people. Before you get to them, you are wondering what the hell is the story with a giant wine cask residing in a Nelson backyard. That was actually an ark, as in Noah. Its designer, Felix Tanner, was a complete and utter nutter. He planned to circumvent the globe inside it. His story follows, or is available, to click in the description. Thanks for tuning in. Welcome to my new subscribers. Relax and let's all take a geese at the Auckland Bridge on Sunday the 31st of May 1959. Bye for now.